Okay. Former council member Helen Gim, thank you so much for being with us. And we're going to ask Morning. you the, the, the one big question here. Um, in your administration, what are you going to do about poverty? Yeah. So um, first of all, I want to paint a picture of what it's like um, in the city of Philadelphia. And there's no question that we have not only just one out of four members, one out of four Philadelphians uh, who experience poverty, but actually 37% of our children um, are born into it. And each and every day should be a mission to end it for, for them and their families. And you can, you can feel that poverty from the moment they're born. I mean, before they're even born, actually. Um, their mothers lack access to critical prenatal care and important aspects to nutrition and access to health care. Um, you know, when they are born at birth, they're so much likely as children to struggle with health and food insecurity. Um, as soon as they become toddlers, they are lacking access to affordable, their families lack access to affordable childcare and accessible pre-K. Um, they're more likely as young people to walk through neighborhoods that are violent, where shootings and other types of crime happen at a, you know, an extremely high frequency in their neighborhoods compared to children um, who do not live in poverty. Um, this child, she will walk through streets and neighborhoods that have far more vacant lots that are much more likely to be strewn with trash. You'll see abandoned cars on the streets. She's so much more likely at a very young age to experience an eviction, to have her family thrown out of their house um, with just you know, a notice of 10 minutes knock at the door. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, as soon as she enters a school, it's so much more likely that she goes to a school that's equally under-resourced, where there may not be a library that is open, a playground that's even available to her. Um, not all of her teachers may be present during the school because the school is often struggling with vacancies. And she um, is so much more likely to live in a neighborhood where the libraries uh, may not be open on the weekends and the rec centers may not be open late in the night. Um, she has a family with unstable work schedules or struggling with uh, dis unstable employment. The issue in Philadelphia is not just that people are poor or that a child like her experiences poverty. It's that everything we do impoverishes her and her family further. And it's why I will say over and over again that poverty at this scale is not by accident. It's by design. Whether it's intended or not, it's by design. And that is why everything has to change. I'm running for mayor because the kids are not all right. And because Philadelphia needs a proven fighter who has a real track record around actually improving people's lives from the ground up and a vision for lifting people out of poverty, not simply reducing a poverty rate, which can happen in many other fashions. But I'm here to lift people up out of poverty. These are our residents and our neighbors. It took a tough Philly mom like me to take on some of Philly's toughest problems. It took uh, you know, it took a mom like me when when schools were being closed down. Um, it took a mom like me to take on an eviction crisis and make sure that we kept families with a roof over their heads. And it's moms like me all over the city of Philadelphia who are up in the middle of the night trying to figure out solutions for their children and families. And for us, the biggest enemies in Philadelphia are cynicism, apathy, and the belief that nothing ever changes. And that's why when I was council member, I showed that it could that we didn't actually have to live like this, that we could end that eviction crisis through smart policies, through rent assistance that would keep 50,000 people with a roof over their heads, that would make sure that we distributed $250 million to small landlords and large landlords and probably one of the biggest rescue efforts during the pandemic. Um, it took, you know, we proved that you know, when we live in a state with a, with a pathetic poverty wage of $7.25 an hour, $2.83 an hour if you're a tip worker, that we had to demand stable schedules so individuals had the right to know how to plan their lives and to make sure that they weren't cheated out of fair work hours that were due to them and that they had scheduled uh, time for. And it's why I've spent so much time investing in our public schools, putting nurses and counselors and social workers and also arts and music and clean water and school modernization programs because every family 
deserves a promise that when their child enters that school building, they will be cared for and they will be safe. And as mayor, I think it's clear what needs to be done that again, as I said, everything has to change. The Biden child tax credit proved that you can cut child poverty in half by simply providing families with significant supports when they have children. And so, you know, that's why I've been very clear that I fought against American Rescue Plan dollars being given away to wealthy individuals or outsiders for tax breaks and other types of things. I want our our supports to go towards families in need. Um, we should be supporting them on housing. We should be supporting care packages for new moms, guaranteed diaper banks and formula access and food banks so we can end hunger and food insecurity for children at their youngest and most important ages when they are developing both in brain and in body, physical development um, and psychological development as well. I fought for shallow rent vouchers on Philadelphia City Council, and I'm going to continue to ensure that housing becomes a fundamental right and all of our city resources and agencies are geared towards those who struggle with housing to make sure that a roof can stay over their heads or that we are going to find one for them and their families. And of course, our city needs all of our efforts to go towards these well-funded schools um, city resources are and city services are one of the key issues that we've got for families who are in need. Um, better sanitation services, every resource at our disposal to keep our families healthy in a city that has that is the only large large city of our size without a public hospital network. You know we need full service libraries parks and recreation centers. We need to make sure that we are cleaning our streets, brightening up um, every dark corner, making sure that we are uh, picking up trash and illegal dumping, that we are taking care of victims of violence, most especially. Um, this is a critically important issue. And that, you know, all of these things are an antidote, not only to the violence that is plaguing our city, but the poverty that is at the root cause of it. Um, and of course, I've been very clear that I think that there is no question that we need to continue to support um, and find ways to lift people up through uh, better employment, but also holding large employers accountable. It's why I support unionization, because it's one of the surefire ways that lift people up um, and ensure that wages matches a company's growth. Um, I want to make sure that in a town that's known for its Eds and Meds institution, that those institutions help us end the educational and health disparities that define what it's like to be poor in Philadelphia, and it should end with all of these um, top-notch institutions that are literally defining our, our world um, outside of it, but it's got to fix the problems here. Um, there's no question right now that Philadelphia needs a massive change, and it can't just be about people paying lip service to quote-unquote anti-poverty agendas that are too broad and don't get in the weeds and start helping people. We can take the actions now. It's what I did before I ever got in to city council. It's what I did when I had some amount of, of influence on city council, and it's what I will continue to do as mayor. Denise, do you want, you want to go first? Sure, sure. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, I guess my first question for you, because what I found most interesting about what you were talking about is that you're probably the only candidate that we've talked to thus far for whom schools were the first thing you mentioned. And I, I guess my, my first question for you is, what part do you believe schools play in helping the city with its issues in poverty? Because as I said, when 37% of your children live in poverty, it is an absolute sin. And that poverty starts at the youngest ages. We have, uh, you know, when people are poor, one of the things that is most defining of lives is the upending of everything. There's such little stability in the lives of people who are who are living in poverty. As I said, they're constantly on the move. Either they're being forced out through an eviction, they've lost a job, um, you know, a healthcare crisis has forced them into, into um, families that are separating. Um, violence in communities and neighborhoods can take away family members um, who are critical to the family themselves. DHS in our world 
can separate um, families that are experiencing poverty um, as much as they do families that are that are experiencing internal strife. Um, and so when you have so much instability, I look for assets in the most stable institutions where all children are are likely to go. And that and one of the places where we get them the earliest at the age of five, in some places we can get them at pre-K if we provide pre-K and head start at particular public schools, we can get them at age three and we can we can hold on to them until age 21. Um, you know, as they make their way through schooling, through puberty, um, through their teenage years and through early adulthood. Um, it's one of the most critical touch points. And the other reason why I value schools is because in the original design and mapping out of the city, there was supposed to be the idea that every school was supposed to be within walking distance of every single family in Philadelphia. It was the roadmap to actually reach families and children, and we should treat it like that. And so um, when you have one of our most core critical assets being sort of a side note or footnote to a lot of mayor's agendas, we're leaving behind an honest conversation about how we're actually ever going to lift not only families and individuals out of poverty, but another generation. We talk a lot about generational poverty, generational trauma. Well, that's because we're not dealing with the young people who are coming in right now um, living it, experiencing it, suffering from it, and we can transform it. And when we do that, it has such a massive impact on years and years down the line. It's why I believe that we cannot have a, you know, a real commitment to an anti-poverty agenda that doesn't fundamentally include the care and keeping of young people, and in particular, the role of schools, um, uh, you know, of family entities and support organizations that can lift families and others up and out of poverty, as opposed to just pushing people out of the city, which is a tried and true formula in plenty of other cities around the country. You can absolutely reduce Philadelphia's poverty rate. You can you know, marginalize neighborhoods and communities. You can push people out. I'm looking at an agenda that actually lifts people out of poverty, um, that helps create generational types of opportunities and ultimately wealth um, by investing in a generation of young people who are suffering right now and who's suffering. We have a moral, political, and economic imperative to actually end. Okay, now one of the ways that folks have talked about dealing with the poverty issue is by getting an increase in the, middle, in, in the minimum wage. Council has tried to do that on various occasions and has had any law that's you know increased the minimum wage struck down in Harrisburg because of preemption guidelines. How would you handle that problem in a way where the minimum wage would get increased and you would get Harrisburg to say, okay, well maybe we need to stop um, abusing the city that is basically our ATM. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's any question that, you know, the voices of the people themselves have to lead this issue. If you leave it just to elected officials, what is politically possible is extremely narrow. When you involve the people of the city um, whose lives would change through a significant increase, um, a transformation from a from a minimum wage state to a living wage state, um, many things can actually change. I do think, though, that there is an economic imperative that should make sense to a lot of, of Pennsylvania legislatures. We're completely surrounded by every other state um, on our borders who have a much higher, significantly higher minimum wage than we currently do. And it's no surprise that Pennsylvania lags other states in terms of attraction of jobs economic growth and opportunity, not just Philadelphia, but across the state. And it's because people are migrating to a state like New Jersey, where if you cross um, simply a river uh, less than, you know, a handful of miles away from, um, from a Philadelphia border, you're getting a $15 an hour minimum wage state. If you go to Pennsylvania, on on um, you know on the Ohio end, which is an extremely conservative state, you're getting a state that has you know a dollar fifty, so what twenty some percent more in higher basic starting wages than everything else. A lower minimum wage, a low minimum wage state, 
is with states that are surrounding us, it's an absolute drag on our economy and every single data point proves it. But I also want to be clear, I don't think moving somebody just from a $7.25 an hour minimum wage to an $8 an hour minimum wage or a $10 an hour minimum wage is going to be transformative in this moment. And it is why the minimum wage is one piece of a long-standing anti-poverty agenda. Um, I fought hard for Fair Work Week because the two factors that influence somebody's income is not just what they make per hour, but how much they make in a year. And hours in an in a uh, world in which we have so much service work, hourly work, temporary work, or contracted out work is as dependent on the number of hours in a week as it is on the actual amount of money you make in that hour. Getting somebody to move from a 10 hour week job to a 30 hour week job is transformative. It is absolutely transformative. That's why we fought so hard to do the things that we can actually do within our city boundaries and to show how that can actually improve and um, lift up people's wages and overall income as we continue to fight for a higher minimum wage. Um, it's why I believe that uh, unionization is one of the most important ways and you're seeing a real expanse of unionization measures all across the city of Philadelphia. Right now, there are Temple grad students who are on strike where the starting wage might be $19,000 an hour, far below um, you know, uh, an acceptable wage or a living wage for a young person who's trying to become the next you know, um, scientist, historian, uh, researcher, and you know, visionary and policy uh, thinker. Um, you're seeing a push for, a, you know, for unionization at Starbucks or at a, um, you know, at the Museum of Art or at nonprofit centers. Um, the and you're seeing an expansion within city government as well. Not only do we did we work to establish a city minimum wage of fifteen dollars an hour that's now indexed according to COLA standards, or or rather, uh, not COLA, but, um, you know, the, the, the increase, like a general, like, increase on, um, on how it, you know, uh, I can't remember how I'm <laughs> using the language, but, you know, it, it tracks um, increases across, the, it's not a fixed minimum wage of $15 an hour. It continues right. to expand and grow, and we help companies try to remember that this is going to grow. So as they're making plans, um, they're incorporating these types of things. It's our new city laws also include paid family leave now. Um, they're setting, we as a city, when we have tens of thousands of workers um, who are here living in the city of Philadelphia is also trying to set a higher standard um, as we work and try to set standards um, and in, in, you know, kind of exhort and encourage standards to continue to improve across the city, even when Harrisburg lags. I think typically it's great if legislature and legislation can be at the front end of something, that's good. But here in our state, despite all the things, it hasn't happened yet. So we are going to lead through every other measure that we can and show Harrisburg how much better, how much healthier we will be as a city, as a commonwealth, and as a competitive state amongst all these other states around us. If we lift people up, we can do it through the minimum wage. We can do it through Fair Work Week. We can do it through unionization. We can do it through the expansion of benefits for and standards through city government and state workers who comprise the largest workforces all across the Commonwealth. Okay. Well, I'm going to give you back to Larry. Larry, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, now, one of the things you had mentioned, uh, it, it's kind of like some, some new programs maybe you were thinking about. Is that a matter of reallocating budget dollars to fund some of these things, or is it raising more revenue? Um, so I think right, it has to start with reallocation, and it's got to start with priorities right now. Um, again, as I said, you know, there were choices that were made about uh, you know entities wanting accelerated tax breaks and other types of things that have there had been proposals that were made for you know kind of outlandish ideas like you know a handful of parking lot owners getting a massive massive tax 
increase with no guarantees of what they would do with that tax break. Um, and I think if those proposals are on the table, if the state at one point or the city of Philadelphia at one point wanted to offer a billion dollars in subsidies to Amazon um, for a competitive nature, then clearly people are thinking ambitiously. I think we can talk about what it would mean to actually significantly lift people out of poverty. I guarantee you it will kickstart econ our economy faster than anything we can possibly imagine. Um, and that we would actually be investing in a whole lot of jobs and support services that would not only um, help lift people out of poverty, would, but would help us create a more sustainable city. If we are dealing with hunger, food distribution, um, warehousing um, and other outreach services uh, to end hunger in Philadelphia, we are going to be a model for the nation and people will want to invest in that. When we are looking at affordable housing, when we are talking about um, keeping a roof over people's heads and we're working with new developers um, who, can, who can guarantee permanent affordability, um, we are tapping into a whole network of individuals who see a new economy around affordability. Um, and especially, you know, I think because we're sandwiched between New York City and Washington, D.C., which are completely unaffordable cities right now, we can attract more people to actually come here and we can raise revenues when affordability is one of the things that's prioritized and it's targeted. Um, I think we can also make sure uh, that that we have additional resources that can go into those things. You know, we proved again, like I said, the Biden child tax credit proved that you can cut child poverty in half. And if that is the case, then we need to be talking both statewide with a democratic governor, a democratic house, and a transforming legislature and our city government and our actors, many foundations and actors who are deeply invested in ending poverty in our city, including our educational and healthcare institutions. The task is not, um, the task is to get started. And I think the city can do that with reallocation of dollars. And then the mission is to drive all of these entities that we've got at our, you know, as our assets towards the common goal of ending hunger, keeping a roof over people's heads, improving schools in a significant way for the care and keeping of young people, addressing violence and support for victims and families who are survivors of violence right now. These things are actually transformative. And I do believe that they will not only make a significant like reduction in our poverty rate, they're gonna lift people out of poverty and that we are actually going to do things that are sustainable over a period of time. Okay, last question. It's, let's fast forward to a cold day, January, 2024. Mayor Helen Gim has been inaugurated. What are the first things you're doing that first week in office? Yeah, so the first thing that we are going to do is take um, the city's gun violence situation extremely seriously. So um, I've said very clearly on day one, I am enacting a state of emergency because if you can't prioritize a problem and identify a problem, you can't fix it. Um, and all of our city agencies are going out in an all out rescue effort especially towards the neighborhoods that are most deeply impacted by violence. Those are predominantly black and brown communities. They have a concentration of young people in them. It is not just through policing and through the district attorney's office. This also includes the school district of Philadelphia. It includes the PHA, our housing authority. Um, it includes SEPTA. It includes um, federal and state law enforcement to make sure that we are delivering a whole set of services to um, end violence and to take people out of the path of it and support victims and survivors. Um, so letting everybody know that we value life here in the city of Philadelphia. Um, day one, uh, the superintendent and the school board will be part of an, 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 an essential part of the mayor's cabinet. Um, we are not going to have separated entities moving at, you know, independent of one another um, without knowing planning together. And sometimes even as we saw with this latest lawsuit that the school district did at odds with one another. This is not a path towards stability. It is not a path towards the school district's success. The school district cannot make it on its own. We need a mayor who can merge the school system and the city in a common mission to take care of young people from the earliest ages uh, each and every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. That's The city can provide the after-school programs, the pre-K, prenatal care, 
that is essential to the healthy lives of children. We can provide um, and work with the school system to open up summer schools year round so that we can have year round engagement of our youth. We need employment opportunities for young people specifically in neighborhoods most impacted by violence. Um, and we need interventions for those young people uh, who are currently in the path of it. Um, those are the things that I will definitely do on day one. There's much more to do um, otherwise, but I have my eyes zeroed in on making sure that every Philadelphian is safe, feels safe, and that every young person knows that all eyes on the city are on them. And this is a city that's going to restore its village. All right, former council member Helen Gaming, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.